Take your Bibles, if you would, please, to Psalm number 20. Psalm number 20. We will find our passage, our scripture there, and we'll also go to another passage in Deuteronomy. So if you have a Bible, I'd probably put your finger in Deuteronomy, and we'll be in Psalm 20 right now. If you're on a digital format, uh, I think you can switch relatively quickly between the two. But Psalm 20 and then the book of Deuteronomy as well tonight. As we open up the scripture and ask God to work through his word for us tonight and enlighten us with his truth. The Bible, the Bible desires, the word of God desires to do something. Jesus is the Word. As we read the Word, we're, we're, literally the Bible says Jesus is the Word. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is the Word. The Word of God, as the Bible says, is sharper than a two-edged sword. It is alive, quick, and powerful. It is an active, it is an active book. The Bible is not a dead book. It is not just a book that was put together by some old people years and years and centuries ago. But by the Holy Spirit of God, the Bible says, worked in and through individuals as they penned these words. And the Bible wants to touch us. And the Bible says about itself that God's word, the words, does not return void or empty. Now that doesn't mean that everyone who hears and interacts with the Bible walks away in agreement with the Bible. Sometimes we use it that way. In the sense, we use it like, oh, well, I, I gave this so God's word will not return void, meaning they're going to respond to it positively. But we know from experience, personal experience, from history, all right, and just from being in this world that people will interact with the Bible, they will know the truth, and some will reject the truth. Some will say, no, thank you. It's not what I desire. It's not what I choose to believe. God's word is not less powerful when that happens. God's word is still true, and to someone's judgment and condemnation, God's word will be in effect. But on the flip side, when we allow God's word to work in our heart, it also will always be effective. It will never return back empty. We always have a choice to make when we're approached with the word of God, either to accept it and follow it or to push it away. Sometimes we push it away very clearly. Where we mentally click out and say, you know what, I will not, I will not follow the word of God. I will choose to ignore it. Other times it's far more subtle. Where you say, that's a great truth. I, I really like that. And I, and I will do that truth. I will follow that truth. I'll follow that challenge, that admonition. I'll do that, but I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it later. I, I, I'll pray about that truth rather than fully accepting and following the Bible. So tonight as we approach the scripture, once with that kind of mindset to read Psalm chapter 20 beginning in verse number 1. The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Remember all thy offerings and accept thy burnt sacrifice. Selah. Grant thee according to thine own heart and fulfill all thy counsel. We will rejoice in thy salvation, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. He will hear him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They are brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Say, Lord... Let the king hear us when we call. Let's go, Lord, in prayer tonight as we look at this passage. Lord, we ask for your help. Lord, I ask personally for your help tonight as I, Lord, in some small way try to communicate and articulate and unpack this passage. And Lord, I don't want to do this without you. I need your spirit in and through me, Lord, to guide me in those things I ought to say. And Lord, I've tried to do my part in study, but you have to work tonight. Lord, I ask you to work in the hearts and lives of all of us, that your truth would be plain, be clear to us. Young, old, Lord, new Christian, and Christians have been saved for a long time. And Lord, I pray that you would touch us tonight, you would meet with us. Lord, we've been spent a little time worshiping you tonight, and now we long to hear from you. So Lord, do something that would be eternal in nature and value, and Lord, far past the times that we remember who spoke, what the service was, we'll remember the truth from your word. Change us. We trust you and we thank you for what you'll do. 
In Jesus' name I ask and pray. Amen. I'd like you to look at verse number 6 specifically tonight to begin. The Bible says, Now know I. It's a phrase that I will often use from this pulpit until the Lord calls me somewhere else, which I have no desire to go, or calls me home, which I'm happy to go to heaven. I want us to remember this phrase that our problem is not normally a knowing problem. Our problem is typically, help me remember it, a doing problem. That is not to say that the Christian life is all about works. There are those that that say, well, there's nothing that a Christian has no responsibility in life. Once they're saved, they can do whatever they wish because God's grace uh, just works in and through them and, and any kind of expectation. Well, that's the word they use is that's legalism. If there's any works attached to it. And, and Paul clearly in Romans chapter 6 argues against that thought process. In fact, Paul says, what shall we they say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he has two little words, God forbid. It's an extremely emphatic negative sense in the Greek that says, may it never, ever, ever be, be, be said or done among Christians. But there's this thought that, that the Christian life is is nothing about expectations but just about God's grace and as long as you feel good about it well then God's happy about it now, I don't know about you but but my feelings can be misguided at times anyone else is in this room shake them or rattle them do, do you ever feel like responding in a way that doesn't line up with the Bible yeah I mean this is reality our flesh is still alive inside of us our problem is not normally a knowing problem it's normally a doing problem The Christian life is not just about works. The Christian life is a relationship. Christian life is a love story. The Christian life is knowledge, experience. But the Christian life, as James tells us, is about some actions. Faith without works, the Bible says, is dead. He's comparing it to like a a human being. They're alive, but they're not breathing. They're alive, but there's no function in their, in their brain. There's no, and if that were the case, we would say, well, they're not alive then. And that's what James is saying. Faith without works is dead. The, the, the works do not make you saved. They often indicate the saving work. So our problem is not normally a knowing problem. It's normally a doing problem. Most likely tonight during the sermon, you will not hear something. And you most likely will not say, boy, I've never heard that before. Now, there could be that case, and, and praise the Lord for that. But, but if you've been saved a little bit, you know a lot about what the Bible says. This psalm was written to us by David, called a man after God's own heart. A man who knew who God is. A man who had experienced the presence of God in his life. A man who had been touched by the power of God on his life. Who had the prophecy of God for the future of his life. God was in this man's life. And he says this in verse number 6. Now know I that the Lord saveth his anointed. This is what I know. What is what David is saying here. He said because of of these circumstances in verses 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. He said... This is now what I know. I know something. I have an experiential knowledge. I have, a, I have a powerful understanding. And then he has this tremendously challenging verse in verse number 7. And that's where I'd like to focus our attention tonight and look at your Bibles, please, in verse number 7. Where David gives us these words, Some trust in chariots, and some And horses. But we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Then I want to challenge us on this knowing versus doing. Because I believe that many of us know the Lord. If you don't, we'd love to open a Bible and show you how much God loves you and how Jesus Christ died for your sins. But many in here know the Lord. You know what the Bible says. Many of you grew up in a home where the Bible was a prominent book in the house. Not everyone in this room, but many of you do, or have. Many of you have been to this church multiple times, and if you've come to this church any amount of time, we open up the Bible. We don't have to make it like comedy hour or just a book of opinions, but from the Word of God. Many of us know, but are we living verse number seven? 
We know, we know, we've even experienced. But are we living, are we doing, verse number 7. I'd like you to leave your, your finger here and turn back to Deuteronomy if you would. Specifically tonight we'll begin in Deuteronomy chapter number 17. Deuteronomy is called the book of the law. And here we have a number of instructions from God to the children of Israel. Inside of these instructions, some of them have, uh, some of them have instructions that will go past Israel in that time. And some stay there. But God in Deuteronomy chapter 17 gives a specific instruction to the children of Israel. Beginning in verse number 14. Where the Bible says, When thou art come... Under the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren, thou shalt set his king over thee, thou mayest not set a stranger over thee which is not thy brother." Now verses 14 and 15 tell us to the children of Israel that one day you're going to go to another land, I promised you, the land of Canaan. You're going to settle there. You're going to demand a king. And when you do this, now you're going to choose one that's not a stranger, not a foreigner, but but one from from your people. And then verses 16 and 17 and 18 are going to be, or the following verses are going to be the instructions for the king. This is what Jesus says here, or God says here, verse number 16. But he shall not multiply horses to himself. Nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses for as much as the Lord has said unto you, he shall not henceforth return no more that way. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself, that his heart turn not away. Neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. Here in Deuteronomy chapter 17 we have instructions to a future king of which David was one. And there, there are three instructions given. One is that he should not multiply wives. This is a good instruction. This is a helpful instruction. Most of the kings ignored that instruction. And the Bible says, if you multiply wives, it doesn't just say you have problems at home. And I'm sure Solomon had problems at home. We read about problems in Scripture when he had multiple wives. All right? But he said, your heart will be turned away. What happened to Solomon? Heart was turned away. The Bible's right. He says, don't multiply silver and gold. We understand that. Though we have money as a tool, we know that we can't be on a mission just to have more wealth. There's got to be more to life than just more wealth. That's why there are people out there who are extremely wealthy, and still are so empty on the inside, even to the point of taking their own life. And then he says, don't multiply horses. Now, Brother Coleman said, remember, I preached this message in high school. I'm not preaching it tonight, but one day I'm going to preach it again. Why no horses? And my wife wants a horse, and you think, boy, this would be a great message for Mr. Reen. But God was not commanding me not to buy a horse for my wife. There's something different going on here. And the answer is found in Psalm chapter 20. Turn over a few pages, if you would, please, to Deuteronomy, chapter number 20. Deuteronomy, chapter 20, verse number 1. When thou goest out to battle against thine enemies, and seest horses and chariots, and to people more than thou, be not afraid of them. For the Lord thy God is with thee, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. One more passage, if you would. I know we're in the Bible over the place tonight. Could you turn to the book of Joshua? The book of Joshua. Joshua will go to the 17th chapter. Joshua chapter 17. Say, Pastor... You're making me turn in the Bible tonight instead of saying in one passage, I know. It's okay. Jo- Joshua chapter 17, verse number 16. 
And the children of Israel said, The hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron. Both they who are of Bashan and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. Now I want you to turn back to Psalm chapter 20, and let's look at this passage again, if you would. Psalm chapter 20. Psalm chapter 20 gives us, in verse number 7, this, I believe, powerful truth. And there's three parts of this truth. Psalm chapter 20, David says in verse number 6, Now I know. Now I know about God. And he says this in verse number 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. I want you tonight to have a commitment to declare that you will, in your life, place your security in Jehovah. Now let's look at this verse and understand a few things about this. Three parts of this verse. Number one, the night in this commitment, in this declaration, I want you to recognize, number one, recognize that not everyone will do this. Not everyone will have their faith in Jehovah. David here in the psalm says, in the first few words, some trust in chariots and some in horses. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, when God gives instructions to the kings, he is in essence telling them, listen, do not place your trust in these war objects that bring apparent safety on the outside. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, verse number 1, that's what we see. They said, oh no, they have chariots and horses. And in Joshua chapter 17, they're saying that the tribes are saying, the, the Canaanites, they have these chariots of iron. Or in essence saying, listen, there are all these countries, there are all these people who trust these things that look really strong. And they look really tough. And they've had success with them. These chariots and horses, the reason the countries use them is because they were successful, not because they were failures. The chariot and the horses during the, the, these battles brought an edge to the battles. They would win the battles because they had chariots and horses. And if it was your army on their feet versus chariots and horses, you were going to lose. So these items were successful, but we must first of all recognize tonight that not everyone will trust and declare their trust in God. There are some that will trust in things that actually will bring some success. You understand so far? You say, well, Pastor, what does that mean to me in 2023? You see, the children of Israel could have looked around and looked at other nations, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Amorites and the Hittites and the Egyptians, they were chased by chariots. And they could have said, look at these countries. They have success. They have big cities. They have mounds of gold and silver and garments. They are prospering. They are flourishing. And they are doing all the things that we're not supposed to do. And so because we want their success, we're not going to do what God says. We're going to do what we see, trusting in chariots and horses. They would have seen other nations with different gods, and the nations would have had visual success. They would have had other nations, observed other nations with different priorities, and these nations would have been wealthy. They would have looked at nations who did not have all the restrictions that they had from the law of God. And they would have seen that their life really didn't seem that much different. And my friend, the same deception attacks us today. As Christians, we know what God says. We know where our trust and where our declaration must be. And yet, if we're not careful, we look around and we see this family. And this family doesn't have the same God that we follow. And yet they have a beautiful house and beautiful cars and a, and a huge financial success account. And the temptation is, wait a second. Why am I doing this 
when I can trust in horses and chariots? Well, why, why am I having these restrictions in my life? Why am I trying to follow the Bible and respond the right way and, and raise my children differently and love my wife and follow my husband differently? Why am I restricted by all these things? And over here, my neighbors, they're not doing any of it. And they're having a grand old time. Their city is big. Their wealth is huge. They're having victories. Right? Understand that the same, the same subtle deception is there today. It's in our churches. It's in our Christians. The same illusion haunts us and the same demons tempt us. The same deceptions plague us. And yet we must recognize that not everyone will declare their trust in Jehovah. And unfortunately, I wish it were the case, but not everyone in this room will do that as well. You see, being in church is not a declaration for trust. Being in church ought to be merely an outflow of what's going on on the inside. And yet we must recognize that not everyone will follow God. We're cheated through empty philosophy. Wednesday nights, we're in a series on the family. In the next few weeks, I'll be dealing with some things with children. There are, there are thoughts all of the time on the internet, in the media, in books, about how to raise kids. And yet what I have found, and I'll say this in the series, what I have found is most people want children that the Bible teaches how to raise. Kids that work hard, that are respectful, that can have joy and laugh and handle a joke. Right? They want these type of kids, but they don't want to raise them that way. They don't want to restrict anything in their life. I find that Christians, you want, I want what the Bible says is available. You want deep-rooted joy. You want strong peace in your life. You want a good foundation. You want the security of God. But if you're not careful, you'll follow the deception of horses and chariots. If I can just obtain this security of this next promotion... Then I can. If I can just have this level of relaxation, then I can. The same deception plagues us today, and we must first of all recognize that some will not do this. Some will not do this. Throughout the Old Testament, the children of Israel repeatedly took their eyes off God and over and over again followed the gods of other nations. And over and over again, God said, stop doing this. Read the book of Judges. It's a cycle. Follow God, problems. All right, then they stop following God and just back and forth, back and forth. And why do we think that our life would be any different? Sometimes we read the Bible and we're like, oh, boy, those silly people. My goodness, how much they're just so shallow. And in your life and in my life, I'm afraid that I'm guilty of the same cycle at times. Easily, easily moved. The words of the song, prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. My friends, first of all, if we're going to declare our trust in God, we must recognize that not everyone will do this. Some trust in horses and chariots. But look at the next part of the verse. But we will remember. Number two, we need a purpose that there will be a decision for God. <laughs> that word remember in this particular passage has the idea of not just like remembering that you forgot to turn off the oven. Right? Oh my goodness, I left the stove on or oh, the door's open. All right, forgot this appointment. This idea of remembering has the idea that you, that you have made a note of something and done an action about it, done something about it. In the Bible, it's used a few ways you may remember when Hannah was praying for a son. And the Bible says that God remembered Hannah and sent her a son. It's used in Genesis after the flood. Noah's on top of a mountain. The flood waters have now abated. And the Bible says, and God remembered Noah 
and then brought the dry land. You remember with Abraham, the word is used again, after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, the Bible says, but God remembered Abraham and then made a change. So the point is not just to remember, but the point is to do something about it. But before we come to that word, we will remember, there's a little word, but. Often used in our society as an excuse. Is it not? I had my assignment with me, teachers, but. You know when you hear that, you're getting ready to hear a humdinger. Right? But what? The dog ate it. The cat ate it. Your parents burned it on the way to school. All right, what are you going to tell me now? But, okay. And, and sometimes people will say, no ifs, ands, or buts. Like, I don't want any excuses. All right, just own it. But, when this word is used in this, in this context, it shows us a shift. It says, some trust in chariots and horses, but there's a shift. There's now a purpose. There's a difference Something's going to change. You see, David, it does not mean that David and his men never sat on a horse. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they never saw a horse or a chariot. It just means that, listen, they chose to put their confidence in something else. And that the battle was not in their strength, not in their weapons, but in their God. You see, this declaration when we purpose, does not happen by accident. Someone doesn't just accidentally begin to trust God. Oh, whoops, how'd that happen? Well, I've been trusting God all day, didn't even, didn't even think about it. No, it's on purpose. We've done things by accident, made messes, broken things, all right, bring failure, but Having security and trust in God is not on accident. It is on purpose. So we must recognize that some will not do this purpose, that our decision will be for God. But at the end of this verse, that we will remember the name of the Lord our God. We must declare that our trust will be in the true God. Three times in this, in this passage, Psalm chapter 20, three times, Name, the name of God is mentioned. Three times. You look at it now, look at it later on, you'll find it. Beginning, the middle, and right here. Three times David points us to this fact. It is not in, it is not in something else, but beside, besides, besides Jehovah. Why does the Bible say his name? Because God's name is a declaration of his character. The name Jehovah means I am that I am. The name of God is a declaration of his ability. The name of God is a declaration of his, trustworthy, of his trustworthiness. You see, if you trust in the Lord, you will take a non-chariot, non-horse position. You will go down to the chariot and horse market and say, you know what? I'm not going to bid on any because I don't trust in chariots and horses. I depend upon the name of the Lord our God. You will at the auction not put your arm up you will, when the time comes, not put your foot in that chariot, in that horse. Horses and chariots are the very pinnacle of warfare. In fact, in Egypt, where the Israelites came from, the Egyptians supposedly believed that the chariot of the Pharaoh was actually divine. They thought it was a deity. And David here so aptly says, some trust in chariots and horses but we will remember we will remember the name of the lord our god the danger here is substitution you will trust something i will trust something but i get to choose what i trust david finishes this thought out in verse number eight he tells us what, what will happen. Look at verse number eight as we finish tonight. He says, they are brought down and fallen. But we are risen and stand upright. Throughout the Old Testament, we find battle after battle where God reigns victorious. Where God brings a victory, supernatural at times. 
Other times through natural occurrences. But he is victorious over and over and over again. But sometimes these nations seem to prosper longer than the children of Israel wanted them to prosper. God didn't just wipe out everything. And sometimes we wonder, well, why do people who don't trust God, why, why are they still prospering? And David says, but in the end, this is what happens. God's way will be upright. Every other way, fallen. Or can we say it this way? Any of that success is merely temporary success. It may be a one-minute success. It may be a one-year success. It may be a lifetime of success. But it is only temporary success. There are some times that, that the bill is settled this side of, of eternity. And there are some times that someone who lives this way and trusts in the horses and chariots of society different priorities and different gods and different trust, sometimes they're reaping those things on this side. It's a travesty. Families blown up. Kids away from parents and parents from kids, husbands and wives of years and years separated, sometimes ending in suicide, depression, anxiety. But sometimes someone can live a whole life this way. And from our perspective, from the outside, you see success. But my Bible says, what will it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You see, we have a choice to make. We know about God. We know about his security and his foundation and his trust. But have we declared our trust in God? Not just a vocal declaration, I trust in God. Not just lip service, but a life that backs it up. Faith and works. You see, you can say you trust in God and go down and buy some chariots. You can say you trust in God and have a barn full of horses and an account full of money and your security in your job and your relationship in your family, in your health, in your own strength, in your mind. Well, I can solve this problem. I can get my way through it. That's horses and chariots. When you declare and you purpose to put your trust in God, that's when life's true success happens. We could take the rest of the night. We won't. And we could give testimony to what God does when people trust in him. Answers to prayers. That someone who doesn't trust God would say, well, that's coincidence. That's coincidence. And that's coincidence. But my friends, that's not coincidence. That's the power of God in the life. You see, as we close tonight, there was a group of people who loved, who loved the chariots. They were the Egyptians. And in fact, when the children of Israel left Egypt... They got stuck by the Red Sea. You may remember this. And the Egyptians followed with their chariots. 600 plus chariots storming down the desert path toward the Israelites. The Egyptians were trusting the chariots and their horses. They went to Moses and Moses, you've got to help us. What have you done? Called us out here to die. Can't you see these war machines coming after us? Can't you see what's going to take place when they catch up to us? And Moses said, you need to stand still and see what God will do. He went to God. <laughs> I'm just paraphrasing, but Moses said, God, we have a problem. It's you versus the chariots. Who's going to be the winner? God, those chariots are fast. They're mean. Horses are snorting. You've got to deal with this. And I'm paraphrasing, and God says, Moses, <laughs> don't worry. I'm not even breaking a sweat. First, he brings darkness on the land. They can't see where they're driving. Hard to drive a chariot in pitch blackness, isn't it? And then a strong wind comes. Moses raises his arm, and God splits the waters of the Red Sea apart. Children of Israel, they have to walk across. 
And I imagine there was a complainer. You know why I imagine that? Because I've been around people who know God. And there's always a complainer. And I know there's some people who are like, man, this is great, walking on dry land, wow. And right next to them, there's some person. <laughs> got to walk. <laughs> God could even give me like a magic carpet. There's a complainer. Don't be that complainer. It's not part of the sermon. That's just free for you. They get to the other side. You know what happens if you remember the story. And the chariots and the horses take off after them. But the Bible says something happened that, that God troubled the, the chariots. These big, strong war machines. These things that were the epitome of war that would bring victory. All of a sudden, their wheels started falling off. Man, if I could have been a part of history, I wish I could have seen that happen. I wish God would have let me be a part of that when I, I would have had a great time. You can just see this Egyptian just, I mean, taking that horse and going, going, going. Angel, uh, ping, and that wheel. <laughs> Come on, like, hey, 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 Gabriel, watch this one, watch this one. He's spinning in circles like this. And the water came rushing in. And these elements, these things that were so trustworthy, they had won battle after battle. Now became their tomb. See, David says, some trust in chariot and horses. And my friends as Christians, we will see it. We'll see it sometimes in this church building with good people who say, I know what God says, but I'm just going to put my stock in this. But, but, I'm going to purpose that I'm going to remember with an action accompanied with that, remembering the name of the Lord our God. I'm going to remember Jehovah, the God who is everything, a God who never fails, the God who cannot let me down, the God who can defeat chariots and horses without breaking a sweat. Tonight, my friend, I'm asking you to make again that commitment to put your trust in the strong safety of the Lord. We'll see everything else around us. Temptations will still be there. But, but, we will remember the name of the Lord our God.